Rasta. Thank you, thank you. Please just put our hands together for the Bamaya dancers. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Please sit down, please. Sit down. Sit down, sit down. Well, that dance you just saw is a dance from the northern region of Ghana. And uh, you saw them dress like women. It has nothing to do with homosexuality, you know, or any other thing like that. Now, the history behind this song is very simple. The dance. There was a time in the northern region of Ghana when the rains refused to fall. And what happened, ladies and gentlemen? The gods were so angry, they refused to let the rain fall. And then the priests realized that the gods love to see the faces of women. Number two. The gods were angry because women were not treated good. Therefore, the rain stopped falling. So what did they do? The men decided to dress like women and then tried to deceive the gods that they were women and they were happy. 
You saw them dancing and putting their legs like this, pulling it out. The rain started to fall. Immediately they started dancing. And the place became muddy. So putting the leg there and trying to pull it out is removing it from the mud. Let's put our hands together one more time. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Honorable Minister for the Inner City, Al Haj, Dr. Mustafa Hamid. Thank you so much for joining us. Minister of State, ladies and gentlemen, for the Inner City. He was the Minister of Information, now the Minister of the Inner City, what we call the Zongos. He's right here with us. We expect many more ministers to join us as we wear on. Okay, time for action. Are you ready for that action? Yeah. Africans! Yeah. Africans! Yeah. Africans, we're rough and we're tough. Africans! Yeah. Africans! Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Africa. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I thank you for coming. We're going to have fun. Now, when you look at Africa, where are we from? Why the name Africa? How did we come by that name? Who are we? Who is an African? Peter Toy says, no matter where you come from, it doesn't matter your denomination, your congregation, as long as you are black, you are African. Okay. But today you go to Algeria. We have people who are white. You go to Morocco, you see same people. I'm going to take you through a very quick journey. Africans were the first people to be created. God is an African. God is black. At the same time, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ was black. Prophet Muhammad was black. So many other different people were black. Of course, that is if you believe that there ever was a man called Jesus. If you don't, don't let this spoil the lecture at all. Now let us go into it. The very first people to throw the head were Africans. Do we have any historical facts? Yes. There was a man called Professor Leakey. Professor Louis Leakey. He was British. But he was born and bred in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, his father and mother were British white. But they were Christians who were doing their service in Kenya. Professor Louis Leakey was a paleoanthropologist. That means somebody who is a historian but interested in the human part of history. Professor Louis Leakey decided to undertake a certain studies. He started with Kenya. He didn't seem to see much. England, he didn't see much. Then he went into the Old Dubai Gorge. Somewhere in Ethiopia, he found out that there were people who lived in Ethiopia. Several, several, several thousands and millions of years ago. And he realized that there was something he called the Zing Anthropos. The Zinjantropos. Now the Zinjantropos was a skull when somebody dies the head that he found in one of those places and the carbon dating showed that it was several, several, several hundreds running into millions of years. So it came to mean that black people lived and walked the earth longer than any other human being. Now there was also Lucy, another skull found. And then there was also Tracy. And today we are hearing that in Morocco, they just found out that there was even an older skull. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Leakey worked around the world. He went to England, went to America, but all the skulls he discovered never even dated a quarter of the years of those that he saw in Africa. If you are following me, then you must understand that Africans trod the earth far longer than any other race. 
ladies and gentlemen. How did we come by the name Africa? There was a time some people called us the dark world. There was another time we were called something else. But there were a group of people called the Berbers. They dominated Libya. They decided to call us Afri. Or Ifri. And in the Berberic language, also in Arabic, when you hear Afri, or Ifri, it means the cave. So the people who live in the cave are known as the Africans. The cave dweller is the African. That is why so many people don't like the name Africa because they see it to be derogatory. On top of the list is Jamaican singer Jimmy Cliff, born James Chambers. He says we should change the name from Africa to something else. But long ago, the whole of Africa was seen as Ethiopia. Ladies and gentlemen, even the Bible tells us that the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers crisscrossed at a point where Adam and Eve were walking naked in that garden called Eden. Today, if we look at history and geography, the Tigris and the Euphrates, they cross at a point in Ethiopia. This is how we came to be called Africans. Because of the Berbers. So it's a Berberic name, Arabic name, that they decided to give to us. That means we here are all cave dwellers. We all dwell in the caves. Africans have been a great people right from the start. Africans walked all the way to Spain, conquered Spain, and civilized the people of Spain. The Africans who went there were called the Moors, M-O-O-R-S. Put that aside. Africans went all the way to Jamaica, set up the whole of Jamaica, went to Colombia, and did a lot of things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you how great Africa was. There was a city known as the city of Memphis, right there in Egypt. The city of Memphis. A very beautiful city. It was built 3100 BC. It doesn't click. 3100. B.C., 3,100 years before Jesus was born. 3,100 solid years before Christ was born. We built cities, bros. We built cities, the city of Memphis. See that beautiful city. 3,100 years before Jesus Christ was born. Watch. You know what happened? The next time Europeans tried to build something like this, it was 1,200 years BC. And that was the city of Athens. It took them 2,000 years. Bros. It took Europeans 2,000 years to build the city of Memphis. An imitation of that city. Hey. And then the Romans also said, no, sir. We have to build something like this. And they came, ladies and gentlemen, with the Roman city. And when the Roman city came out, oh my God, when was that? Another 2,000 years. So Africans did the one step and it took Europeans 2,000 years to reach there. The African army was a very dangerous army. We were the very first people to fight underwater. Our enemies are over there. Somebody is underwater. Don't ask me how he was able to breathe. Technology, gorilla war tactics. He swam under the water and appeared in front of the enemy, conquered the enemy without the enemy realizing. It was taught to us all the way from the Ghana Empire. And beyond, there was a great king in the Ghana Empire called Dinga Sise. 
Dinga Sise was a man whose title was Kayan Magan, which means the Lord of the Lords of the Gold. Kayan Magan. Powerful king. And in history, he was a man who could appear and disappear before Obinim even thought about it. Appear and disappear. Appear in the form of animals and appear like wind. Whenever you saw whirlwind, yes, whirlwind, then you will see the Kayamagan, aka Dinga Sise, from 700 AD. People worshipped him as God, not a God. They went to his house and worshipped him. And when he wanted rain, all he did was to stare at the sky, not even raise his hand. Stare. You see, they don't understand the power of the African. So all these things they say is a myth or a legend. But we know who we are and we'll continue to know who we are. When Okonfo Anochi raised his hand, the golden stool dropped up to this date. They call it a myth, right? But when Governor Hedgehog came all the way from England, he went to beg to sit on that golden stool. What did Yah Asantua say? That be yeah, yes, sir. If it was a myth, how come the governor was so interested in that mythical golden stool and wanted it down? Okonfo Anochi was not a European. Was he an American? Was he a descendant of Trump? No, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. That empire called the Ghana Empire was not called Ghana Empire for nothing. Its other name was Wagadu. Which means in the shade. The home of the Du. Ghana simply means the warrior king. Because they were warriors. And nobody could ever defeat any Ghanaian. Not today's Ghana. Ancient Ghana. See what happened? People were coming from near and far to learn guerrilla tactics. People were coming from near and far to be taught simple things that Africans knew. Africa was 2,000 years ahead of the whole world. Hey, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. Everybody knows Julius Caesar. What did Julius Caesar say? He said, Ex Africa, Simper Aliquid Novi. Ex Africa, Simper Aliquid Novi. He was so bamboozled by the might of Africa that he said that from Africa there is always something new that is mythical. Julius Caesar, the one that you go to school and worship, that he was a king, great king. He opened his mouth. He was shaking boog, 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 like he had what? Boog, 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 right? He said, Ex Africa, Simper a liquid novi. Look, the African military power was so strong until the 14th century. And whilst the Ghana Empire was rising like a column of mercury, there was also the Hausa Empire. Ladies and gentlemen, our military power was great. Our architecture was superb. We taught the illiterate world how to read and write. We taught the whole world how to read and write. Somebody sees it like some myth. Sees it like some Anansi story. Hieroglyphics. We taught the world. Hieroglyphics. You know how many years ago? How many thousands of years before Christ was born? We taught the world that. And several other languages. And several other ways of writing. Before the Chinese came with their cuneiform. Several thousands of years after hieroglyphics. We taught the world how to smelt copper. Another meaning for the word Ghana. is a soninke word which also means the blacksmith. The world were still using stones when Africans 
were using fire to smelt gold, to smelt some other things. Seeing, ladies and gentlemen, the might of the African. We're still talking about yesterday. What the African was like. So if you truly know your power, if you truly know who you are, you will never sit back and let somebody call you an illiterate when your ancestors taught them how to read and write. If you truly know who you are, you would call yourself the master architect because when we built the city of Memphis, 3,100 years, it took all those people 2,000 years to have an imitation which was not even a proper imitation. Our military power was unsurpassed. But something went wrong. And that is today. Ladies and gentlemen, we started inner wranglings. The Ghana Empire started fighting. The Ghana Empire rose to its peak by 1700. Started, rose to the peak by the 9th century. Hey, and then, ladies and gentlemen, religion. Religion. Christianity came in, but the people of the Ghana Empire, the people of the Nigerian Hausa Empire, they were not interested in that. Gawa was not interested. Kumbi Sali did not even want to hear about religion. They knew what they knew. And they believed in what they believed in. Worshipped what they knew. My brother, my sister. It started creeping in like a canker. After Dinga Sise, two of his sons started fighting. Blah, blah, blah. Then it came all the way to an Akan man. And he was caught in coming in. Tinka meaning. He was the last king of the Ghana Empire. And he was ruled as the most democratic king in the world. He moved from place to place. Dinga Caesar used to sit in his compound. And people used to come and worship him. This man went from house to house worshipping people. And then, Islam came in. Islam hit Africa in the 7th century, just around the time Muhammad was about to die, in 632 AD. But Islam came to Ghana Empire in the 9th century, 200 years before Muhammad died, the prophet. And after Islam came to the Ghana Empire, it took another 500 years before it hit Nigeria. Today, Nigeria is one of the biggest countries in Africa that practice Islam, right? After Islam hit the Ghana Empire, it took 500 years. And then there was division. I am a Muslim. I am a Christian. Holy Jesus. Fighting. Inner wranglings. I don't belong to you. My faith says that I should eat this. I should not eat that. You are different. Hey, and then somewhere in 1066, the Almoravids, they were Arabs. They came all the way to the Ghana Empire trying to conquer them. But in coming in, resisted for 10 years. In 1076, they conquered the Ghana Empire. And that was the end of the Ghana Empire. When they conquered it, ladies and gentlemen, Hi. The accounts were not happy. They ran away. They didn't want the Arabization and the Islamization. Some other people ran away. The Dagombes and the rest of them. And of course, but at that time, the Nigerian Empire was still up. It went all the way to the 19th century before it collapsed. And same thing collapsed it in wranglings. Osman Dahodio came in, fought the people, defeated the houses, and turned the Hausa Empire into a Fulani Empire. From Hausa to Fulani, the Fulanis were powerful under Osman Dahodio. But they also collapsed. They had such great queens like Queen Amina of Zazao, who united all these wonderful people. 
But what does the Nigerian Empire even say? They said it was founded by a man who came all the way from Baghdad. He was called Abu Yazid. But the Nigerians called him Bayajida. That's right. Long and short, inner wranglings collapsed us. Religion collapsed us. And then, ladies and gentlemen, that was yesterday. Now we're entering into today. After independence, when Kwame Nkrumah in the big six got the independence for us from 1957, hey, Remember that after before all these things, there was slavery. Transatlantic slave trade won. This is worth mentioning. Which started in 1502 and ended in 1580. Then came transatlantic slave trade too. Which started from 1580 and went all the way. Some people... Stopped it along the way, but others continue. So we are not even able to tell you when it ended. And they took seven to eight million Africans into slavery. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of you will say, wow, seven to eight million people. But that was nothing. The Arab slavery took eight million Africans into slavery. So many people don't know this. Arab slavery. You must be part of my religion or else you are a slave. And sheer hatred. Eight million. Plus the eight million white people took. Sixteen million Africans sent into slavery. And at that time, the total population of the Ghana Empire was only 30,000. Imagine, sixteen million. Ladies and gentlemen, Today we have a beautiful Africa. But Africa is still divided. Religion is dividing us. Idiosyncrasies. This is my ideology. That is not my ideology. I am Anglophone. You are Francophone. We still have problems. Happening right here in Africa. The white man left us with so much the, the, the most terrible thing that ever happened to Africans. My brother was slavery. Tell me any other thing that happened to Africans. Imagine that we were 2,000 years ahead of the rest of the world. And all of a sudden, we were crippled. Hey, Julius Caesar, ex-Africa, Simper. A liquid novi. In Africa, there's always something new. Forgetting the role of the popes in slavery. And then, ladies and gentlemen, just as we're about to recover from slavery, there came colonization or colonialism. After 16 million people were carried into slavery, my brother, my sister, they came in with colonialism. What is colonialism? Now we are not going to carry you by force and chain you and take you away. No, sir. What we do now is, oh, stay in Africa. You rule your people, but we rule your gold and your diamond. There was a very dangerous king, King Leopold II from Belgium. King Leopold II. He was so arrogant so thieving, so dangerous. King Leopold II of Belgium in 1884, he said, oh Europe, oh America, please let us all unite so that we can go to Africa and share that common good in Africa. Let us enslave them but free them, hold their minds, and take all their gold and their diamond. And that was what they did. King Leopold, the ugly looking guy there. That's what he did. He was a king. Listen, he came to Africa and went all the way to the Congo. 
and he slept with the beautiful women there, those who refused to be slept with, he cut off their hands. Sometimes he found a way of making hair flat. Okay, you don't have it anymore. Go. You don't have it. I will enter. You say no. Okay, I'll close the gate. Go. And forced men to go out and bring rubber. If the men were not able to bring the rubber, he imprisoned their wife and used them day in and day out until they were able to bring the rubber. Sometimes they will even cut off their hands. If after two months you don't bring the, the rubber, one hand of your wife is gone. Another two months you are not there, the other hand is gone. So your wife is walking like a mannequin. You see that? That's what this guy did. And the worst of it all, brethren and sisters, he decided to name the whole Congo after him, his arrogant self. He called it Leopoldville. See? That's what that guy did. And it was his personal property, not the property of Belgium. He served the interest of Belgium, but as for this one, the women are too sweet for me to give to Belgium. Hey, the robber there, America once said, I can't give this to Belgium. It was his personal property. In 1896, they forced him to relinquish the Congo. He died in shock. He went and was crying. A few years later, he died because he lost the great Congo. And if you know Congo, you know what I'm talking about. Kabila's Congo and all those places. This guy fattened himself with the riches of Africa. Another arrogant, sick liar. Who was Cecil Rhodes. He was a guy who was dying from asthma. He went to school. They sacked him. Every, you go, <coughs> <coughs> coughing. So the teachers were afraid. He said, no, this is a contagious disease. He got go home. He went home 17 times in one month. Every time he was coughing, he was sick. They sent him home. And he came home to die. One day, somebody told him, Cecil, you know, there is a place in Africa where the air is so unpolluted. And you know your sickness is a respiratory one. If you go to Africa, you will breathe fresh air. Unlike the air here which is polluted, you will be okay. His mother was a common housewife. Excuse that language. And his father was a catechist in the church who earned almost nothing in the name of Jesus. So what happened? He got on a ship on a loan that he had from his auntie. On that ship, he went to Africa as his last hope. Cecil Rhodes, that guy. The sick guy who had bronchial asthma got to Africa. A few miles into Africa, the air that he breathed, his lungs opened wide and beautiful. Oh my God. Whoa, this is magic. He was cured within days when he entered Africa. This is history. This guy was cured. And when he was cured, see him, he went after a Zimbabwean king called Lobengula. Lobengula was a king over there in Zimbabwe. Of course, at that time, it wasn't called Zimbabwe. And he controlled the gold and the diamonds in the area. This guy went to him. When he went, Lobengula was sick. He had fought and was sick. He was suffering from gout. And he said, oh man, I got a doctor. I'll bring you a doctor to take care of you. But the doctor would only heal you if you can sign part of the land as a concession. Listen. Concession, loan. Go and mine. And after one or two years, go back to your country. But the king was illiterate, Lobengula. He signed the birthright of the whole of that area to this thief. And they cured him of the gout. They were there every day. The place that used to be peaceful, bears were flying. Now, machines. Lobengula said, oh, sir, you've been here for over 20 years. Can you 
a leaf is said, man, what? Look at the paper. You signed it for life. The matter went to England. The matter went all the way to England. And the Queen of England saw the papers and said, ha, 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 we got him. The sick guy who was about to die became the richest man on earth from the gold and the diamonds and whatever that he was able to get from Zimbabwe. And the Queen of England was interested in it. Lord Bengula sent some people to go to the court in England and when they arrived at the seaport, they frustrated them so much, refused to allow them in, they had to return to Africa and cry. So when Robert Mugabe came into power, he said, Lord Bengula's land, we are taking everything. We will even remove Rob Lobengula from his grave. He sold Zimbabwe. And the statue of that man, you saw that picture. Bring back that picture. You saw Cecil Rose standing on top of Africa. He also named that portion of Africa after himself. Just like that other guy, Leopold II. Cecil Rhodes. He named the whole of Zimbabwe and a big part of South Africa, Rhodesia, after his name, Rhodes. Arrogant. You were dying. A certain people saved you. You decided to colonize them and steal from them. And later, when he died himself, he didn't live long. He died around 50, uh, 56 years. This guy, they used part of his money for sponsorships. And the sponsorships sent some American presidents to school. People like Bill Clinton. The money this guy stole from Africa took to America and England and those places to establish scholarships, served and helped some American presidents. Ladies and gentlemen, we are winding up. Today in Africa, a lot of our leaders have been inspired by the treachery of Cecil Rhodes, by the treachery of King Leopold II, by the treachery of the people who came to colonize us. At this juncture, I want to also uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Drop That Chamber. Drop That Chamber. You all remember Drop That Chamber? There he is at the back there, ladies and gentlemen. Drop That Chamber! We shall speak truth to power. You can do all you want to do with me, but you will not stop me from speaking because we shall speak truth to power. Truth to power. Truth to power. Drop that chamber. Ladies and gentlemen, now a lot of these people have been inspired by some of these thieves who denigrated us. Somebody like Jean Bidel Bokasa. Bokasa was a dangerous thief. Dangerous thief. Jean Bidel Bokasa. He sat on a golden throne when his people were looking for water to drink. When he had very wonderful parties. He didn't like the beef. Neither did he like the fish. He liked him on flesh. He was a cannibal. Cannibal. Because his uncle was also a cannibal. Jean Bidel Bokasa. Please, roll down the picture, man. You're taking too long. Jean Bidel Bokasa. Cannibal. And who was he eating? He was not eating the Europeans, so. Neither was he eating the Americans. He was eating his fellow Africans. Look at the throne. Everything there is good. He was a man like a dot. Like a dot. Please, I mean this man in Central African Republic. But he had power. There was another man called Bartholomew Boganda. He was the one who brought the independence to the people of Ubangichari, a.k.a. the Central African Republic. But when they realized he was going, like Kwame Nkrumah, they killed him in a plane crash. Better let me, Boganda. 
ladies and gentlemen, of Central African Republic. But this guy stole so much money. Mobuto Sasaseko stole 25 billion American dollars. If Ghana had that money, we would build one million of those chambers and we would still have money. If Ghana had that 25 billion, hey, Chinese people are bringing us two million, no? Two million dollars. And we are so excited and flying our wingless wings. 25 billion. Nam one owes 40 million dollars. And there's so much noise all over the place. 25 billion American dollars. That guy called Mobuto Seseku. He was three times richer than his own country. And when his country needed loans, he loaned them the money from his own account. He built a very huge mansion. And in the mansion, there were as many as 117 rooms. And he himself slept on, in only one room. The rest of the rooms were later occupied by bats, snakes, wolves, thieves, and lizards. All these people were coached by the white man who came to teach us that stealing is okay. By the same white man who came to teach us that corruption is okay. Somebody doesn't understand this. When he told us that he was closer to God, God had blue eyes like him and had silky hair like him and talked to him directly and we saw him raping our great grandmother. Oh, then it's, it's okay to rape. If he's raping and he's still closer to God, then that's okay. He stole the gold and the diamond and he was still closer to God. Even there, I can't say, if you are going to see God and you meet the white man, stop! Because you've seen God. True or false? It's a prophet in Akan. And what do the fantasies say? They say, Aban on swa oyabade ochu. In other words, when he has to do with the government, don't carry it on yourself. Pull it, drop it on the floor. In other words, if you steal from the government, it's all right. If the government employs you to work eight hours a day, go there and work two minutes, and the rest of the time, use it to do Facebook, leg book, stomach book, and at the same time, you can do whatever you want to do, including lotteries, right in the office. Look at what is happening in the government institutions. They get the employment and they are the least working people. All men fill up the place. They are 42 years every year for the past 20 years. Every year they are 22 years, right? And their sons are in the house and are about to hit 50. Yet they have been 42 for the past 20 years. And they are happy to come home and say, oh, massage my back, my hair. You dye your hair every day. You have become the rock of Gibraltar, rock of ages. You never grow old. And yet, when you come home, ah, Kwame, are you not looking for a job? Why? You finish with a good degree. If you retire, they will get the jobs. It is happening. Go to every government institution. Any African who rises with power and wants to speak truth to power, they graze themselves with bullets. Look at what happened to Sankara. Sankara was extremely militant that no other African president was able to reach that feat. Militancy, radical power. He said to hell with the IMF. He said, every government institution, remove all the air conditioners in a country that is landlocked. Somebody doesn't understand that. There's no sea in Burkina Faso. When he inherited Burkina Faso, it was called Upper Volta. Upper Volta. He said, what name is that? Who gave us that? Oh, Volta. That's in French. He said, no. I have changed the name. It's called Burkina Faso, which means the land of the upright. People who walk with pride. Like that. 
And that was what he wanted his country to be like. He himself died with only one motorbike and one sports guitar and a bicycle whose tie was wobbling pa, 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 on the road. He died. Nothing. But we killed him. His own friends. See what happened to Kwame Nkrumah? He wanted to race Ghana to the top. First, he started by removing that Gold Coast mantra and said we are called Ghana with the help of J.B. Dangwa. What happened? Ladies and gentlemen, they killed him. They killed Bethlehem Boganda. They killed Patrice Lumumba. Any African who rises, as long as you are ready to speak truth to power, be ready to enter a premature coffin. But of course, as I said it the last time, I will prefer to live a few years and be an achiever than to live and never die and be a hopeless, deceptive liar. What, what do you want to live for? What do you want to live for? Islam is one religion I love so much. Islam says that live your life every day as if it was the last day of your life. So when you wake up, put it in your mind that I might not return home today. What are you going to do that day? Bob Marley said, if life was about me alone, then me not like it. That was why everything he had, he gave out. But that's the direct opposite of our people. The stealing, the robbery, the, the agents of Cecil Rhodes, and so on and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to wind this up. It is sad. We break traffic rules every day. Our leaders who try to rise. Oh, traffic rules. I want to reach quickly. The one behind you, maybe his mother is dying. He needs to get there too. You think you are the only one who is in a hurry. We go to the hospitals. Nurses are slapping pregnant women because they are screaming too much. People are losing their babies. They give birth to babies and the babies are missing. We still believe in human sacrifice and rituals. We live in a country where the politician is seen as the richest. So there's so much pressure on the politician. You go to the politician's house, oh my God, even politicians who never like dogs, now they have 10 dogs in their houses. Because there's so much pressure. You encourage them to steal and to rob. They own V8s all over the place. 10 V8s, yes, your salary is 10,000 Ghana cities. What magic. There's an archbishop over there who has a WC that is gold plated. What the heck? An archbishop who is supposed to be leading people to God. The people bring you taxes in the name of tithes. You use that to build a WC that is gold plated. And you are arrogant enough to say that you are an achiever. You are a thieving achiever. Hey! When the British High Commissioner showed me this in London just a month ago, I saw the picture. I almost flew to Mars. A president is supposed to be traveling, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, 10 people at most. He ends up going with 250 people. The rest are throw throw drivers who have paid money to some chief, uh, what, what, staff chief, whatever it is. And the American embassy now is shocked, says that, no, we have banned you. You lost Deborah is the one I'm talking about. And we have the facts. So they can't talk. You understand? If you think that is a lie, let them flex their muscles. Let's check it out and see. Why were you banned from going to America? And then the facts start. But these are the people you run to for help. Where are they going to get the money? Where would they get the money from? By putting throat throat drivers and Kobe sellers as the entourage of the president. Australia, there was supposed to be a, a match for mumu, dumb people and blind people, whatever it was. 
What happened? Ghanaians who are two legs and two legs and could see from here to Mecca, could hear every single thing, went all the way as part of them. Some of them were walking like they were sick. And when they arrived in Australia, the Australian authorities, when they were coming down from the plane, they saw some of them talking without a normal sign language. They followed them. Everybody was mm, 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 like that. Crying shame. They deported all of them here. Your Black Stars goes. The total amount of money, that is the price money, is 4.5 million. In this time of doomso doomso. In this time of triple tracking, quadruple tracking, whatever tracking. In these times when Zongo people have been turned into macho men and vigilante. 4.5 million. They blew it like dust. You have no mercy for the country. I don't like military government. But there was a man called General Gay. Gay. G-U-E-I. In the Ivory Coast. When the Ivorian team went and played loosely at the African Cup, you all remember what happened? He pulled them to the military camp and made them hop like that. He lashed them one after the other for three weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Africa that has been bequeathed to us. We have leaders who are vampires. We have leaders who are looking at the next election rather than looking at the next architecture. We have leaders in Africa and Ghana who pay ignoramuses to talk and not to think. They pay the so-called communicators to sit on radio and TV with their latest insults and throw at each other the more you can insult, the best communicator you are. And they pay them to insult. They pay them to talk, not to think. How can we change this? How can we change this? Africans are good at talking. We talk, you go home, you forget. We are entering into tomorrow. How can we change this? It's very simple. What did we do that made us the best? We must go back to our military. One, all the diamond, the gold, and whatever, if we mine them at all, let us not sell that out for money. Let us sell that for technology. The technology that they stole from us. The Egyptian architecture. We want it back. Today, your uncle dies and they put him at the morgue, the mortuary. You are paying every day. In Egypt, they will just embalm you and you will be there for thousands of years. Where is that technology? Where is that technology? Where people could fight underwater? Today, put our soldiers underwater for 30 seconds. They will become fish. Today, you can handpick one or two politicians who truly have the nation at heart. Recently, you saw MPs breaking traffic rules with impunity and arrogance in the nation's interest. Yes, snap me again. I say, snap me again. MPs, they are just making the laws for us. Yet they break the same laws that they make. How can we move? Recently, when I was in England, listen, the prince of England, he broke a traffic rule, and the next day, he took his license to the police. Gee, I broke the rule. I'm sorry. This is the punishment. Take it for life. He will never drive again. Today, they arrest Kwame. He's calling his uncle, who is a corporal, police corporal, corporal. Corporal calls sergeant. Sergeant says, oh, I also know the commander. Oh, commander, ah, do you know who you arrested? Uh, Kwame Mensani uh, Ba Kwame Aoko School or Tamasko no or no ni. Oh manuko manuko garden or no kwana. They do it. Can we move? Finally, ladies and gentlemen, if we we have looked at Africa as it was yesterday, 
we have looked at Africa as it is today. We owe allegiance to the white man. Don't also forget the role of propaganda. The very first, I'll give you an example from Ghana. The very first kingdom that rose from Ghana was Nagbewa's kingdom. But did you ever hear that? It's all about Ashanti. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because there were propagandists like Edu Boahim, historians who were extremely biased, who will not write the true history, but history to favor them and their ethnicity. That's the same thing the white man did. I'm not saying Asante Asan Kino wasn't great. No. I'm just talking history. Tribalism is killing us. We need to think about a strong unity ourselves as Africans first and foremost. If we don't, it is very terrible. That's what broke the Ghana Empire. That's what broke the Niger Empire. The Gao Empire. Because all the people started inner wranglings. When the NDC started inner wranglings, somebody was insulting who it was eating into the fiber. Before I realized, it collapsed. They say, and the great account people say, Abu Abekawa. So if you will collapse, if you will die to come from within, if we don't learn to unite, it's going to be terrible for all of us. Our military is gone. Now we have gold and diamond. Give it out. Get technology. Think about the next generation to come. And not about what you will get right now. Right now, Nana Ado is busily trying to do his one district, one factory. Well, it's a very good thing if it could only happen. But my brethren, a Tiwa forest is going to be broken down. Some other forests will have to be broken down. When the Chinese come here and flout our rules, we let them pay some money and then we let them go. Right? Don't think that's the legacy we want to see. We have to be strict. If your brother is caught in the web, let them suffer. Tell him, brother, I love you so much, but when it comes to the law, we have to uphold it. Stop the bribery and corruption. Stop the tribalism. And that way, we will be able to move forward. There's a saying that I'm going to end with. And it's coming from our own Adam Kojo. I don't know how many people know him. Adam Kojo said, and I quote, oh, I love this saying. He said, the African today eh, is torn from his past, propelled into a universe, fashioned from the outside, and dumbfounded by a cultural invasion that marginalizes him. In fact, my brother, the African is a distorted image of others. Think about it. Listen, he summarized what me and you are. We are torn from our past. Do you know of Asimeni? Do you know Ndeura Jakpa? Oh, now, was it that wild animal that... Uh, how about Okonfu Anochi? Okonfu who? Ah, is it Kweku uh, Bonsam or who? As long as it is not our parochial history, we're not interested. The African is a distorted image of others, not even himself. You are quarter American, one eight Chinese. Because the belt you are wearing was, was made in China. The pants you are wearing under there, not, not the trousers, the pants inside is made from Afghanistan. And you represent a certain culture that you don't even understand. You don't even know your religion anymore. Adam Kojo, the African today, is torn from his past. If we were still connected to our past, we would have known that we are kings and queens. 
we were born from the backbone of the Dinga Seizes. Born from the backbones of the Toaje, the Red Hunters. The Nana Prampes, the Ya Asantoas, the Queen Nannies. Yes. And not, how many of us have names as Francis? Names as uh, Naomi, Noah. Maybe you want to bring another flood, so you are called Noah. So we are torn from our past. Ladies and gentlemen, they say too many cooks spoil the broth. At this juncture, I want to say thank you so much. And I want to also say that we all need to unite as one people. If we unite very soon, as we said, we're going to be inviting all of you to come on the street and speak truth to power. We will speak truth to power. It's happening in Uganda. Bobby Wine is there. They broke his legs a number of times. But the man said, it's just my leg. My brain is still working. But we are all scared. Nobody wants his ear to be broken, let alone his leg. When we all say, when we are pow! One shot. Everybody gone. Muslims are fighting Muslims. Christians are fighting Christians. And the Rasta people that I thought were in the minority would have also come together are also fighting each other. Traditionalists are also fighting each other. But there's hope. If all of us here decide that when we call you out, you will come out and hold a placard. Just stand by the road like those people who have the placards and say, Jesus is coming soon, you would also hold it and say, Mr. President, we are humans too. Or, crime is crime. Please fight crime and not faces. Nigerian thieves. And the Nigerians are stealing, faking our money. Crime is crime. People are faking. So go after the people and not the Nigerians. Let us all come together in the spirit of Africa. Speak truth to power. I admire that. Listen, Fellini, play me that video of the guy who was going to be deported and he didn't want to come home. Play me that video. Can you get off me? Can you get off me, man? Get off me. Get off me. Let's play. We will see what's going to happen. You're going to be that day on day. Why are you crying? Get off me, man. Get off me. Can you get off me? What? Okay, you fucking get on my summer. Get off me. Can you get off me? Okay, get off. Get off. I say, can you get off? Can you get off me? Can you get off me? Can you get off me? Why you want me to say that? Can you get off me? Can you get off my summer? Can you get off me? Can you get off me? Why you don't get off me? Why? I don't know why. You're telling us. Who I am, so? Can you fucking get take off your on me? Yes, we can. You have to relax though. Get your fucking feet down. Get your fucking feet down. Why you fucking put your feet on my summer? Okay, can you put your fucking feet down? That's an old man, man. Get your fucking feet off, bro. Put your fucking feet down, man. Your fucking feet down, man. He's yeah, not an animal, bro. He's a man yeah, before anything. He's not an animal. Down. Get your feet down, bro. Bitch. All you have to do is calm down. Damn bitch. What I just made, get on me. You don't need to give me water. You don't need to give me no water. Just let me go. Just let me go. That's what I know. You're going to let me go or not? Okay. No, I got to go. Let me, let me get, get off sir, me. Sir, I got my case open. I said fight in my case. So why you want to report me clandestinely? They don't even get my, my, they don't even get my travel document. Can you see that? They don't even get travel document. What are they doing so? You see that? You see that? What illegal thing you're doing? You guys remember, you know what you're doing, right? Huh? You know what you're doing? Huh? 
those who raya marrow could those bitch accept that even somebody they taking somebody with a travel document. That's you see so that, far, bro? Huh? Yeah, yeah. You gotta say something too, bro. No you can't fly you like You cannot fly like this, this way. I will I, never. I'm saying it. Why you flying around the court? Why? I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I don't have a on his phone, though. If you want it, you let me know. I don't care. No, I said if you want. Can you let me go out? Unfortunately, I cannot. You won't let me go now. I cannot. Let me go, man. Let me Yo, go. we all gotta say something, man. This is not right. This is not right. This is not right. This is not right. I didn't do nothing wrong. I didn't do nothing bad. You're doing like you never see nothing. How somebody will travel like this? How you guys will see somebody traveling this way? How you guys will see somebody traveling this way? How you guys will see somebody traveling this way? How you guys will see somebody traveling this way? I didn't do nothing. Nothing wrong. Okay. Everybody gotta say you something, to bro. You don't you not see nothing. That's fucked up. This is not right. This is not right. If he's not right, you have to stand for him. This is not right. I say, you he's have a black man before anything, bro. You have to say something. Those people don't have car. I'm telling you. You have to say something. This is not right. This is not right. You have to do something, people. This is not right. You have to do something, people. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> you have to do something. Hey, my people. You have to do something, man. You have to do something, man. This is not right. I need to do nothing wrong. They treat me like a criminal in your eyes. You didn't say nothing. You have to say something, please. You have to say something, please. Hey, guy, you have to say something, man. You have to say something, man. Hey, these people are going to treat me this way. You have to say something, man. Because we didn't want to go to the White House. Today we are crying not to even come home. You saw it? You saw the white man at the side there? He said, man, I can do it, man. Black man is the one thumping him. He has the muscles. And listen to the language. He's already beginning to be torn from his past. I apologize for the expletives. You know what we need now? We need militancy. And militancy is speaking truth to power. Truth to power. Speaking truth to power. And we are not afraid to say it. Young people of this country, rise up. Young people of this country, this is your nation, rise up. Our leaders are foolish, tell them. We are not afraid of anybody. You can kick me, beat me, kill me, but you will not stop me from speaking. I will say what has to be heard. I will speak truth to power. Nobody will restrain me from speaking truth to power. I will say what I have to say. Drop that chamber. Drop that chamber. If there are no men in this country, I will stand up and say it. Drop that chamber. I have to speak truth to power. We don't carry arms. We are not here to beat anybody. We are not here to molest anybody. It is simply to send a message. As to my hand, yes, resist it. But you simply want to handle me simply because you lack the courage to tell them in the face that drop that chamber. You lack the courage to tell them the truth. Drop that chamber. This is the stop. You will molest me, you will kill me, you cannot restrain us from saying what we have to say. Drop that chamber. 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 You can kick me, I don't care. Drop that chamber. Drop that chamber. Yes, we are fighting for all of you. Whether you are a police officer or a security guard, the conditions of service available to you are bad enough. And this is simply what we are saying. We are allies. But if you want to be zombies, carry on. When our leaders match us, we want to be as diplomatic as possible. Sometimes there is something called positive defiance. It might not have been the best ways to approach things. But when the leaders refuse to listen, another way out is to break the protocol. 
A man is standing. You want to handcuff him. He's not resisting. He's only talking. Then you are kicking him and trying to be untrained, untrained security. If this was America, maybe people could have sued for assault. Ladies and gentlemen, drop that chamber. <laughs> Thank you so much, my brother Abu Abeng, here yeah, for this wonderful thing. Okay. So, I thank you so much for coming for this lecture. We're going to open the floor for questions and answers. But before then... <laughs> Yo! Kai! Shankali from Africa! Tio! <laughs> Tio! Fatio, 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 Papa Salma, Fatio, Ankuma, yeah, Fatio, Fatio, Ankuma, Ankuma. appreciate it all right i appreciate you all right so i mean another one for black rasta <laughs> yes so my name is osman black i want to ask how religion and spirituality can affect us intellectually and consciously in developing or making africa and Ghana a better place thank you thank you so much i mean briefly um, religion is different from spirituality. Haile Selassie said that until people decide to be spiritual rather than religious, we will continue to run after the shadows of our colonialists. Religiousness is when you cannot pray to God until you wash your face. Religiousness it's when you cannot pray to God and at least you have some anointing oil in your hand. Religion is when you cannot pray anytime until a Sunday or Friday. Religion is when if you don't wear a certain kind of clothing, you cannot pray. But spirituality is deep within that you can even pray and communicate and link with your maker Without people saying that you are opening your lips. That is spirituality. That you can sit back and it's not a show. You see some people holding, you know, that you know, he wants everybody to see. Some people are praying and then when goats are coming to eat their food, they are clapping. Pa, 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 hey, 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 sh then. No. Religion is when you sit and you claim you are worshipping, yet you are on Facebook and doing WhatsApp. That's religion. Spirituality is when you get into yourself. Even 7 billion people could be making noise, but deep within you, you are communicating with your maker. 
Next question. Most of the times, uh, we end up asking our government to give us free things. And I believe that those things are not helping us because we put them in the position of not being accountable for the money they spend because we call it free. SHS, now we are calling for free SHS. Let us tell our, our parents that they should rather tell the government to create jobs for them. When the jobs are there and they are being paid well, they can pay their school fees. But if we sit at home and then we call the government to give us free, then we go back to them and tell them to account for the money they've spent on free SHS. It doesn't make sense. We want jobs. When there are jobs up north, every region in Ghana, I'll be able to find one and pay for the children I bring into the world. Responsibility. Let us stop calling for free things, please. Thank, Thank you. My name is Empress Osage Fowa. Please, please, my Lord, I want to know why you said Jesus was a black man. Okay, well, I mean, that's supposed to be for another time. But even when you read the Bible and go into the book of Revelations, that's the easiest I can tell you. We can go deeper. You know, it says that John had a vision. And in that vision, Revelation was written by John. He had a vision. And in the vision, he saw Christ. And Christ had eyes that flamed like fire. His hair was wool. You know? It's black people who have woolly hair. It's black people who have eyes that sparkle like fire. White people have blue eyes, pink eyes, and they have silky hair. See? We can go deeper into it. But, I mean, yes. We, Christ was black. <laughs> All right. Big up, Black. My name is Reginald K. Um, I want to ask. Um, I'm the guy who believes so much in Pan-Africanism. Pan um, I want to ask, is there any link with Pan-African spirit and um, um, reggae music? How does it go? And if there is, can you give me a deep explanation? Wonderful. In fact, I almost forgot about Pan-Africanism. One of the things that can help us liberate ourselves and our minds from colonialism and neocolonialism is Pan-Africanism. Same thing Kwame Nkrumah preached. What is Pan-Africanism? It is an intellectual movement that seeks to look for the interest of continental Africans. That's the key word. Continental Africans and Africans in the diaspora so that they will stand independent. Pan-Africanism is an intellectual movement. Intellectual movement. And look at the great Pan-Africanists we had. They were all intellectuals. Marcus Gave, back to Africa. Paul Kofi, Sankara, Kwame Nkrumah, and all those wonderful people. So anybody who thinks about black people standing independent, anybody who's looking forward to the great things of black people, to return to the days when we were kings and queens, we are Pan-Africanists. And that is the way forward. Adam, Kojo, that we are torn from our past, right? And we are propelled into a universe that is fashioned from the outside. All the things we witness are from there. They have no link to us. You are asking if there's a spirit that joins all these things. Of course there is. Pan-Africanism eh, was begun, in fact, intellectually. Intellectually. From a brother from Barbados. Right? Somewhere in uh, 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 1800. They had their first meeting in 1802. Right? 1800. 100 years later, in 1900, Ya Asantua was fighting white people to liberate herself and fight for the golden stool. Look at the link. There was a gentleman called Otuba Kuguano who was taken all the way from Ejumako. He was born in 1757. For me, he was the first Pan-Africanist. He wrote letters to the British Congress 
A slave who taught himself how. He was a boy of six years when they took him into slavery. From Ajuma Akunye. Otuba. Kwabna. Kuguano. He was born in 1757. 200 years later, Gold Coast moved from Gold Coast to Ghana in independence. Look at the link. Started from Barbados. Came down. 1800. 1900. Yeah, Asantua was fighting for Pan-Africanism. Right? 57. The man that I see as the first Pan-Africanist amongst us. And he joined hands with some other people. Otuba Kuguano. 1757. 200 years later, in 1957, Ghana was independent. So everything is, God is linked spiritually. Pan-Africanism is the key. Reggae music is all about Pan-Africanism. That was how it started. It was ordered by the Marcos Mosiah Gavi. Play reggae music and liberate the minds and souls of the people. As you hear in culture's music. But of course, somewhere along the way, it got into other things like the dancehall that, you know, glorified other things. Apart from, there's actually nothing like reggae dancehall. It's either reggae. It's reggae, actually. And from reggae, we have the dancehall. We have the reggae hip-hop. We also have the, uh, how's it called, the lovers rock. And so on and so forth. I hope that answers your question. Next, Hello. this man. This man is called Professor Tutankhamun. Yeah, good evening, sir. Um, due respect. This is, this is our captain. We need soldiers, mental soldiers, like this one. And when we have more of this, then we have more freedom, we have more dignity, we have more pan-Africanism, we have more of all that. Uh, respect to you, sir. Thank you. I want to put add a comment to the one that a question somebody just asked whether Jesus was a black man. I want to make a point here. Listen carefully. God did not send. You can refer me to any professor in Legon, anywhere, any place in the world. God did not send any prophet in Bible or Quran who was not African. I want to repeat, no prophet existed who was not African. The last of them, Muhammad, peace be on him, his mother's side was Ethiopian. And if you have 5% African in you, you are African, he had more than that. Jesus was pure African. The mother Mary was called Mary Amun. Amun, when the Muslims and Christians pray and say, Amin, there's no Amin in Bible or Quran. You can go and check. Amun is the name of the creator God, which is an African word. To thank Amun, where my name comes from. If you are ever here, Esinam Amun. The wife of Tutankhamun was called Esinam. Esinamun. And to thank Amun means Tut, the prince, who is Ank, the link of Amun, the representative of God on earth. See any language in the world, Chinese, American, British, anywhere. If you find Amun in that language, then they are the origin of people. It doesn't exist. Thank uh, you so much. With due respect to you, yeah. I've got books here. Africa, the light of the world. How Africans taught the world. The lecture of the professor here. Everything is in that book, if you care when you are passing. With due respect. Thank to you. you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, I would also like to add, uh, I mean, so many different things happened. For time, we're not able to go deeper. But as with time, we'll go deeper into so many different things. I mean, the father of medicine was Imhotep. He was African. The father of medicine. And Africans did caesarean operation. Those of you who listen to African history class. Caesarean operation for our women. Felix showed them the picture of Africans doing caesarean operation in Uganda. Long before white people discovered anything like that. African people also did brain surgery. They call it what? Craniology. Cut the head like this into four. Open the brain. Talk to the brain. But before they did it, they did some 
sacrifices and the rain fell. I want the photograph of caesarean operation in Uganda. And you will look at it. Look at it. Look at the knives. And look at where they hang their knives. Look at the woman lying down there quietly. And in that pot on the right, far right, they had what was known as banana wine. You would drink it, your eyes. Look, when Africans did this kind of operation, the woman did not need to fall asleep. She opened her eyes and saw everything coming out. They removed the baby. And within 30 minutes, they sold back the whole thing and the woman was strong enough to walk back to her house. Uganda. See it. Where is that technology now? When I was coming up as a young boy, 17, 16, anytime somebody was pregnant in my village, you know what we did? We had to pray that the person would return. Out of 10 who went pregnant, 7 would die. When we had this technology, look at the knife. You see, look at, and we, uh, just imagine, they were all standing naked before somebody's wife. But no erection. No erection. Professionalism. Professionalism. Naked. Look at the one bending down. He's looking into things <laughs> and making sure that things worked right. Truth to power. <laughs> Africans also did craniology. Cut the head and looked inside. If you can find that photograph, give it to me. It's so much under pressure. Anyway, more, more contributions. All right, thank you. I'm Nana Nkansa Kwati, and I'm highly privileged to be part of this wonderful lectures. Thank you, Black Rasta. I, I have two questions, and since I don't have uh, the... Okay, yeah. One... Can we believe wholly in the Bible? Because uh, I can see reggae musicians, uh, culture, most of the times he talks about the Bible. Can we believe wholly in the Bible? One. And two, the next question is, uh, corruption is everywhere in Ghana now. Do everyone have the right to sue anyone? Let's talk of just recent Afghan and the money they have been mentioning. Even when you calculate, you can't even get it. Can anyone like me, a layman, go and sue them for that calculation that I can't understand? Can I sue them? Beautiful questions. Please put, put your hands together. You see? That is why it's important to have these sessions. We are trying to feed your yes, I. upstairs. You can't start a revolution when you are ignorant. When you know what you know, same way if you know, you've looked at the whole thing and seen that it is terrible. These people are lying. They are stealing. You talk to a lawyer and go as a citizen. Go and do it. But the biggest and the nicest is when we all come out, when we hear it and speak truth to power. That's what Marcus Garvey did. You hold the placards quietly and all our grievances for one week if 10 people stand here, the next two days they are standing somewhere else. People who will click anywhere you stand, take a photo of yourself and put it on Facebook. The movement has started. Marcus Garvey was rejected by Jamaica. They kicked him out. At the time, he had 4.5 million followers. Four times bigger than Jamaica and even more. A man had followers more than his own country four times. We start small, but we grow big. You were asking about the Bible. The Bible is one of the old books that we have. And Ethiopia, and in Ethiopia, they have one of the oldest versions of the Bible. Of course, with time, it got corrupted. Otterbill says this over and over. But some people are so dogmatically glued to their faith that they will tell you, oh, the Bible says, thou shall not add anything nor remove anything. That's what they said. But it also said, that shall not fornicate. Do you fornicate or not? The fact that the Bible has said it doesn't mean that people are not doing it. People have attacked the Bible so much in the past. 
Arabs went all the way to Egypt in the days of Umar bin Hattab and fought the Egyptians and stole wild, crazy Imhotep manuscripts. Manuscripts that taught us how we could connect with God and speak to God like our friend. Manuscripts that taught us how we could have operations in a jiffy. Umar bin Hattab, one of the followers of the prophet Muhammad, the one who compiled the Quran that we read today, was the one who did it. You understand? The Christians and the Muslims have enslaved Africans more than any other person on earth. You get it? Yeah. So when you look at this and look at yourself as an African, okay, that is it. We have the books. They get corrupted every day. The Bible is one of the most corrupt books that we have. Corrupt in the sense of corrupted. I'm not saying it's not bad. You understand? I have to explain so people do not get it wrong. It is a book that is holy. The Muslims believe in the Bible. I believe in the Bible. I use the Bible. But recently, what did Otterville say? I think two weeks ago. He said there are some verses in the Bible that are stupid. Right? The man who translated the Bible into English was a homosexual. King James. Right? He was a homosexual. My brother, do you read the Hebrew Bible? You read the English Bible, right? The man who translated it was a homosexual. You understand? So things like that. With time, other people translated. They translated. Once we keep translating, we have the Revised Standard Version. We have the Jehovah's Witness Bible. We have the Roman Catholic Bible, which has more books than any of the Bibles, and so on and so forth. Which one do we read? You see, it is still authentic, though. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Black. My name is Barab Gwanyo Gabriel. Uh, the question I want to ask is uh, uh, what you are teaching us, honestly speaking, we've, we've not been taught those things whilst we were going through school. And sometimes I think about it, I say, where, do you, where did you get all these things from? And now that we also want to liberate ourselves, Nowadays, we don't even have libraries that we can go to, or the libraries. I, I, I don't know whether they exist or not. And it's not everybody that can also go online and then get some of these things. So how, how are we going to get all this knowledge? If there is any uh, advice you can give us as yeah. to where we can get some of these things to be reading. So we can liberate ourselves and also embark, follow you on this journey. Thank you so much, yeah, my brother. I appreciate you. Yeah, uh, somebody asked me the same question on class, F uh, class FM this afternoon. You see, I started from somewhere. You should also start from somewhere. I will encourage you to listen to Pan-Africanists, first and foremost. Listen to them. Some of us who speak Listen to us. Once you have the passion, you would follow your passion. Read as many books as you can. Some of them are biased. Some of them are nothing but propaganda. But as you read and compare, the truth shall be saved. Read and compare. Don't read one material and take it as holy, that's it is ended. No. You must, you must love reading. And at the same time, you have to listen. Talk to the elders. Love to travel. When you travel, look at those places. Ah, how did this? Eh, mm, okay. Mm, eh, mm, like that. Listen to people. You will make it. In, I, I never studied history. But I studied it on my own. I'm a trained land economist. And an oil and gas specialist. But I'm doing history. Have the passion. You'll do it. Next one. Yeah. I am, I am Paloa. Thank you. Yeah. We've been on the fence for so long. 
right from the days of slavery to colonialism up to date. Now we are in neo-colonialism. We are not free. And I doubt if we will ever be free. Where is the turning point if we will be free? Because looking at what is happening today, the leaders, they are not giving us any hope. We can't even cultivate to feed ourselves. Where is the turning point if surely we will be able to carry the future? Beautiful question. Please put your hands together for him. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something. Marcus Garvey was rejected by Jamaica. He went to England, he was rejected. He went to America, initial rejection, and he started to raise his own people. I love Marcus Garvey. Garvey said, let us empower ourselves. If this brother there has a farm where he plants his corn, call another brother who doesn't have it. Let's all belong to a certain group to see to our welfare. That way, each one teaches one, or each one teaches the other, and each one feeds the other. That way, we will be able to empower ourselves. There's a cartoon I love so much. If I knew this question was going to come, I would have prepared that cartoon. <laughs> you know what? That cartoon, you will see a politician standing on a balance, like a stone like this, and there's a plank on it. Like seesaw, seesaw. He's standing here on one side and the people are standing here. And he's holding a gun to their head. And at the back, there's a gorge, a cliff. There's a sea at the back. And the people are all standing on the other side. They've raised their hands. What do they have to do? Let's move out and see where he will be. You are those who have given the power to the politician. Don't give them the power anymore. If you are tired, refuse to vote. If you are tired, look, look. We are not angry enough to move, but I like the awakening these days. Like I told you, I went to London the other day and people were busily drinking Johnny Walker. When I was there to talk Pan-Africanism, when I took the microphone and I was talking, they were doing selfie. <laughs> so I said, what the, what the heck is happening here? Are you here to fight corruption in Ghana? Because of that, they are angry with me. They don't want to invite me anymore. But who cares? We will keep speaking truth to power. If you do that, that's what made Rasta rise. Rebellion. Don't go begging for crumbs from politicians. Don't go begging for crumbs from politicians. Stand firm. Educate yourself. You don't have to go to the university. Not all of us were made to go there. But you can be more useful than even the professor. Marcos Gave did it. And you know who learned from Marcos Gave? The nation of Islam. Started by Muhammad Fard. Before it came to Elijah Muhammad. And in 1930, the nation of Islam was formed. 1940, Marcos Garvey died. The nation of Islam, they took all the principles of Marcos Garvey. When Marcos Garvey was talking separatism, segregationism, where we say, okay, we are black people. Let us handle our issues. We don't like people infiltrating who are not part of our race. So what? Race first. That's what Nation of Islam preaches. You've listened to Farrakhan, right? He says, no. We've given the chance to white people to fool us for too long. Now we need to put our house in order. When we are in order, then we can invite you back. But for now, leave us alone. That militant stand. That was what made enemies for Marcos Garvey from Du Bois. And also from uh, 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 that, 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 that other guy. What's his name? Padmore. George Padmore. Let's not go too much into Marcus Garvey again. Yes. Brasa, Ededegan. All right. My name is Ras Osajifu Dwabil Tendandok Gomadok Yinzobe. Thank you. 
yeah man i'm not obliged to applaud anyone here but i just want to give credit to the don dada um ras as what and then the minister um mustafa amid one big one to royal kofi asante and then brian ns you are my role model black my question now is um talking about um season roads you said i want to know how he was saved by his people saved by his people yes please okay give okay. thanks father in just 30 seconds i will handle your question lobangula was very angry he sent his people to go to england and deal with the situation he was not interested in leaving his land again in the hands of cecil Rhodes. and when cecil Rhodes quickly ran to the queen of england and said you know what I tricked an African buffoon into signing this. This is how much gold we have there. If you want, allow them to come in and sign it. We will lose all this. Queen said, whoa, okay. So they stopped them right at the coast before they entered America. They frustrated the contingent that went to uh, uh, England, sorry. And they had to return. Imagine going by sea all the way from Zimbabwe to England, then they will not allow you in. Oh, you need to sign this paper. Ah, you should have brought that paper from Zimbabwe. If at all, go back and bring that paper. Frustrated them and they returned. And Sissy Rose continued to steal the diamond and the gold. Does it answer your question? Thank you. Next one. Much love. Um, Nia Ite Skin Tit. And my question is um, in as much as corruption is concerned in Ghana here. Philosophically, I want you to draw a, thing, a thin line so that we can see the government of Ghana, with regards to the government of Ghana, what can we do to help solve the menace of corruption? Because, like you were saying, Kwame Nkrumah and its cabinet, they were able to tolerate corruption and during their time we can see vast and enormous, I mean, economical growth than that of today. Thank you. We were never corrupt until a white man came here. I was at Anomabu Fort. How many of you have been there before? Yes, sir. You see, only two people. This is the third person, fourth person, fifth person, sixth person. Six people out of the seven million people we have here. <laughs> because the tourism authorities do not even respect history. I went to Fort Williams and it has become, excuse my language, a latrine where the white man built and was firing muskets and all the cannonballs in Cape Coast. It's a shithole. There's another one behind it. They call it something, something. I went there. Oh my God, have mercy. Even the road to that fort. I had to hold my nose like this and jump, jump like that. Because there were heaps of things I don't want to mention here. <laughs> Different colors. <laughs> wet and dry. And we have videos. Hey! That is your history you are playing with like that. And when I went to Anomabo Fort only last week, I saw things. The white man taught us corruption. We need pan-Africanist leaders, not orators. Not people who will make speeches and people who go crazy and say, hey, that is great. We need the action. The rhetorics are too much. We need leaders like Sankara. Look at Farrakhan. Farrakhan has spat out some of the most venomous things in the world, but he's still alive. We fear too much for our lives. What do you need your life for? To continue suffering? You are selfish. You don't want to die, but you want to have children to come and inherit the nonsense that is happening? Is that what you want? It is time to rise. Somebody had to die. You go to church because we say Christ died for you. 
He was in heaven and then God brought him down and he shed blood and died for you. And you are happy. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Let somebody love you to die for somebody to love you. You don't want to die. But you want to go to heaven. Has any living man gone to heaven before? You want to live for 100 years with no achievement. We have two more minutes to close. So we'll take the last question. Hello, hello. Hi. Black Rasta. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a sink here. Oh, sink. Yes. yes. He's all the way from Denmark. Yeah. T um, thank you. I have uh, some comments to some of these questions. Uh, one was, uh, where do you find the information? And um, if you go online, there's a place called archive.org where you will see books dating back to about 500 years ago. Some of them written in English you cannot understand, but you learn to understand it gradually. And you also see older versions of the New Testament there. So you can trace the whole discussion that white people were having about whether or not uh, people from the motherland were humans or animals or whatever they were. You can trace the whole discussion. You can find the first time they sailed to the Congo, up the rivers. Everything is written down there. So, okay. My name is PSCA Kofi Baboni. Uh, <laughs> okay, I know it's an interesting name, but one day we'll get into it. Uh, somebody asked a very simple question that uh, we, we feel so powerless. That what is the, what is the turning point towards the thing that we are discussing, and how can we get there? So somewhere last year, I joined a group called Sankofa Family. And one of the things we are doing is to advocate for culture and do training. Culture, advocacy, and training. So we realized that one of the things that our forefathers did that we were able to build great civilizations was through communal labor. People understood that the land was theirs and they must develop it. So we decided that every month, we would just pick one day and then do a cleanup exercise once a month. Tomorrow at the Bola Beach, just behind the art center. We will be meeting again, just for cleanup exercise. As many as we believe that the things that we have heard, we need to take action and take it now. We must decide from somewhere. And we believe that if we decide to take the responsibility into our own hands, like standing uh, by the roadside with placards by, I mean, doing cleanup exercise, then you can speak to power because you have taken an action that needs to be confirmed. Thank you very much. I would like to ask a question and then suggest something as well. Please, I would like to know, how many of us have the constitution available to us? How many of us, by hands? One second, hold on, I'm hearing some other voice. Okay, all Go right, ahead, please. I was asking, how many of us, by hands, have the constitution available to us? We know we are a democratic country, right? And we are governed by the constitution. How many Ghanaians have the constitution available? All right. Um, that is our problem, I think. Because we are being governed by a set of rules. And if we don't know the set of rules, then they are going to do anything they like to us. That is if we don't know. All right. How do we solve this problem? Um, I'm a fan of Joseph Hill, Mr. Joseph Hill culture. I love him so much. He said something that I would like to say to you all. The biggest mistake they ever made was to teach us how to read the law. And I think if we want to solve our problems, we should go after the law. If we know the law, then we will know what we stand for. I had a personal experience at Underbridge, Ashaiman where a policeman was trying to take bribe from my brothers and I because we weren't with helmet while on a motorbike. And I know that a police officer taking bribe is an offense. So I only asked him a question. And then the entire scene changed. I only asked him whether you are the one asking for the money. Because I know he's not supposed to take the money. Yeah, I have offended. I accept. I'm without helmet. But as a police officer, I also know that you are not supposed to take bribe. And that question I asked, guns were pointed at me. I tell you. Yeah. The question was I wanted to, I wanted to know. 
Are you the one that has, is asking for the money? That we should pay 50 CDs before you release our motorbike to us. And guns were pointed at me. So this is what I'm suggesting to you, brothers and sisters. We Thank should know so the law. Much. Thank you. And um, Joseph Hill saying that um, the biggest mistake they made was to teach us how to read the law. In fact, we actually taught them the law. The first time law was written, it was in the days of Hammurabi. Hammurabi wrote down the laws and all that. And then the first time ever, we could go out and read our laws. So Africans taught them how to read the law. Run things. Rasta. And um, my name is Hadi Aku. Um, I am very delighted to be here because this is something that I think has to be in our classrooms every day. Unfortunately, it's not. And if you see the kind of history that's being taught in our classrooms, they start the history from slavery. You know, so you are made to think that the African history started when Europeans landed here which is not the case. And it is something that is baffling because for those who believe in evolutionary theory, they believe that the first human being was African. And then they tell you the history beginning from slavery. The contradiction is that from the, first, the time the first human appeared to the time of slavery, what happened within that period? They never tell you. Because that is where the civilization that empowers you is. Yes. Today you find in our basic school um, curricula advantages of slavery and colonialism. My goodness. Basic school curriculum. What is it meant to do? Because education is part of a system of oppression that's supposed to dampen your spirit. You, you must have no heroes to look up to. When you think about philosophy, you must only think of Plato or Socrates or Aristotle. You must never think of Imhotep. When you think of medicine, you, ha you have to think of Hippocrates of Greece. When you, when you think of history, you, you, you think of people who... Herodotus. You must never think of Persehet and all that. Because they are people who look like you. And if you think of them, it empowers you to want to be like them or even greater. If you look to white people, you are only struggling to be like white people. And that makes you a, a distorted image of another. And I would just like to close by saying yeah. that the drop chamber my man is called Ernesto Yabua. He leads yes. an organization called Fighters. Economic Fighters League, in short, Fighters. If you go on Facebook and just say Fighters. It's a radical movement um, mobilizing to bring down the system. Let's not fear to say that we want to bring down the system. Because the system is oppressing us. And we want to bring it down. We must no means where There's no diplomacy in this. So, um, thank you very much. Thank Black, you. I appreciate for it. All my name is Prince Sapun. Yes, and my question is, um, um, Black, you were talking about uh, slavery, and then um, I was uh, expected, expecting to hear about um, three ships that were involved in slavery. That uh, I've read in a book, and that was um, SS Jesus, SS Maria of Lumbeck, and SS Zonk. Yes, and I, I want you to tell me something about that, that three ships. Were they the main three ships that came to Africa here just to enslave us? Or there were so many ships, but they were the only three main ships? Imagine 16 million people going on. Three ships couldn't have done that. You see, the story of slavery is another thing. When I go into it, we will not live here. Let's do it another time. Um, I think we should redefine who a leader is. Sometimes we think if you are a leader or if you say leader, we think of the president, we think of the minister, we think of any big man as a leader. But what impact are we making in our small corner? 
Because if you teach children or you teach at school, what do you teach your students? If you are leading your siblings, what are you demonstrating to your siblings? So I think we should make an impact in our small environment. When you come to my office, my workplace, they call me Black Rasta. They tell me I'm too serious because I work with time and I'm there to work. They think that why is it that when they are smiling, they are talking, I'm serious working. And I make them understand I'm there to work. I want to enjoy the money I'm earning without regretting. So if I'm working, I have to work so that when I'm enjoying, I know that I worked for the money. So I'm thinking that we should all start making impact in our small corner. Let the people know who you are so that when you become the minister, nobody can doubt your credibility. Thank okay. you. Okay, please, I came very late, but I would like to ask, because right now the problem with we as black people in, on this continent is that our current leaders are misleading us while spending the big money. A typical example is Woyomi money. 51 million Ghana cities. If you convert it into dollars, let's say it will be like 15 million or 20 million dollars. But at the same time, they have people in the north who had spent or misused like 145 million dollars and claiming that the files or the guinea files went to Burkina Faso. So I saw that, you know, instead of we chasing the actual things right here in Accra, I know. I'm supposed to make it short, but right here in Accra, we had the Accra Drainage Project, which was like $660 million or something like that. But it went without they doing the work. What are we supposed to do to these our current leaders so that they can rise up and do the actual work that we are supposed to progress with it? That's what I want to ask. I will answer so, this. The, let's put our hands together yes. for the brother. I will answer this very, very briefly. You see, that is when we need to drop the chamber. That is when we need it. Positive defiance. Let's get out there. Hold our placards. Let's stand firm and let the people get to know that we are now angry enough. We have woken up and we want some kind of answers from them. Or else, we're made in Ghana products. Use made in Ghana products. Empower your own nation. You cry that the country is broke. But you are wearing something from Italy. You are wearing something from Japan. You are helping the Japanese. It's so annoying, brethren, that you have a Chinese, roach eating, eating Chinese, come into this country, lumber rosewood. What did the, the minister say? He said when he saw the amount of rosewood, his legs started shaking. He was about to pee. He thought that the whole place was dark. Rosewood. Then your senior minister will say, oh, you go to China after all, you bring us money. You go and bring Gandhi. Gandhi into Ghana. Right here, at the back there. Because they gave you some money from, for sugar factory at uh, that place. Commander. But they forgot simple economics, competitive demand, and competitive supply. Oh, uh, okay, Commander, they grow sugar cane. Let's put the factory there. They went and got some money from India. But commander people realized that ah, they like apitashi more than the sugar. So when they grow the sugar cane, they turn it into apitashi and drink. And the factory continued to rot. In Guyana, I've been there. Black people have decided to stop militantly from going into Indian shops to buy. The years South Africans were over there killing us like mosquitoes in Soweto and other places. That was when we were all running to shop right and uh, other places to go and shop them all. You have no conscience. Because we are so uneducated. Hey, let this happen in America. The whole place will shut down. Even illiterates in America know that, oh, this is the shop that is killing us in that country. That's why homosexuality is so powerful. When the Arabs start to shake themselves and whip homosexuals, they say, okay, we ban all Arabs from coming. But we, oh, holy Moses. That is the time we'll even patronize their goods more. Our tailors are running out of business. 
A tailor. Let alone a designer. Because a tailor is cheaper than a designer, right? You don't want to eat banku and uh, akpla anymore. You want to eat pizza. Please, let's not laugh at this and take it consciously. When I started wearing my African attire, I never looked back. See? Even if you don't look good in it, you'll find a way of looking good in it. That way, you will be militant enough to get your I mean, country rise. Or else forget it, brethren. We will continue to linger in this kind of uh, environment and it will not take us anywhere. Last question, sister. Good evening. Mm. Mine is Frida from Tadi. I'm so excited. This is my first time here. God bless you. I love your message. My message is you should love one. Thank you. She done gurgula na chalar kanyo tiya. She done gurgula na chalar kanyo tiya.